Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. Okay, Linda, today we're going to continue our discussions about topics in computational complexity theory. Do you feel that you have an understanding of what that means, computational complexity theory? I don't know. Uh, It's the number of steps it takes to complete some algorithm. So more steps equals complex? Yeah, so I guess we say the complexity of an algorithm is how it scales with its input size. So if you double the input size and it takes twice as long to run, well, that's a linear growth. But actually a lot of problems you might want to solve they grow in much worse than linear time. Some some actually do better. Some can do logarithmic, but we see a lot of polynomial time algorithms. That's where it's like a nested for loop. And we also see worse things like exponential time. So you're measuring complexity based on how long it takes you to get the answer? That's exactly right. Conditioned on the length of the input. Mm -hmm. What complexity theorists do is they put groups of problems together or groups of algorithms together in what are called complexity classes. So things that have similar asymptotic results that, you know, as the size of inputs grow, they have a similar result. Those would end up in the same class together. So those polynomial algorithms I I described, those are all in class P. And today I want to talk about a class called NP, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. But I thought it'd be fun to talk about it in the context of the game Sudoku. Do you know Sudoku? Yeah. So have you ever played Sudoku? Yeah, earlier in the days when it was taking off and more popular. Yeah, did you give up on it? You didn't like it? Well, I feel like once you have the strategy, it's not that exciting. And oh. you just repeat it. Yeah, tell me about the strategy. I don't remember because I don't remember the rules. Oh, maybe we should cover that for the listeners. So in typical Sudoku, the one you'll play in a magazine or whatever, it's a 9 by 9 grid, and it has some numbers revealed. And uh, to solve it, you have to fill in the missing numbers. And there are some constraints. Every row and column has to have the numbers 1 through 9 not repeating. Also, every group of three by three, so if you divide the grid into three rows and three columns of three by three, those little subgroups also have to have the numbers one through nine not repeating. Yeah, I remember now. You reminded me. If we talk about the asymptotic results, it'd be like, well, what if we had instead of a nine by nine grid, like a 81 by 81 grid? We could make the problem bigger and therefore harder. But I guess most people are only going to be familiar with the nine by nine problem. But to think about it from a complexity point, of view, we have to acknowledge that the problem size can grow. We can have a much bigger version of it. For now, let's just think of that 9 by 9 grid. I know it's been a while since you played. Do you have any sense of some of the strategies you would take uh, on a new puzzle? You just start counting up the letters that are already filled in Mm -hmm. and work on the ones that have the most hints on those rows or columns. That's right. Yeah. There's a lot of ways you can get hints. Do the rows give me hints? Do the columns give me hints? Does process of elimination give me any hints? There's a bunch of procedures like that you could follow to solve a Sudoku puzzle. So do you think someone who is pretty good at Sudoku could write all of their strategies into an algorithm? Oh, it's very possible. Actually, the computer, even if you just did random, they'd figure it out and get there. Tell me more about this random idea so people are clear on what you mean. I could just start filling in numbers for each of the values and checking if it works. And if it doesn't work, change it. If you did that way, let's say you go through the whole puzzle and you just roll a die and then uh, fill in random numbers. You fill up the puzzle with all your random numbers. What do you do next? Then you check it and see if it's right or wrong. And if it's right, you say, I'm done now. I accept my results. What do you do if it's wrong? I assume if you're rolling a dice, roll the dice again. Yeah, you erase all your marks and start over again. Trial and error. Do you think that's the smartest way to solve Sudoku? I would say if you're a programmer and you're lazy, sure, and you have (laughs) the bandwidth and it will figure it out maybe faster than a human, sure. If you guess, what are the odds you're going to just, in a coincidence, guess correctly? It's a little bit like winning the lottery almost. Well, it's greater than one out of 10 since most some rows, if you're going to start with the rows that have hints, right? Oh, yeah. So you're saying take into account the hints and then uh, make some guesses and go from there. Yeah. Now you've actually hit on the most important thing I wanted to talk about today. I didn't know you were going to get so far ahead of me. And it's the aspect of guessing. Do you think the guessing is required? Could maybe someone who is really good at noticing all the hints figure out the puzzle without any guesses? Uh, When I played it, Uh I did not, unless the hints were placed 
where all of them were like on the same row, <laughs> uh-huh. um, which they weren't. I would actually say you need to guess. Yeah, essentially you're saying like, yeah, this is the best strategy we know of, but wouldn't it be great if we could say this is provably the best strategy? Sure. Because then you'd have a lower bound result, right? You'd be like, yeah. You math people just no want to prove <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, no one can do better than this one algorithm. Right now, the best algorithms for Sudoku, they're in this class NP that I haven't defined yet, but it involves the guessing, like you said. And as far as anybody knows, there isn't a way to do this in poly- to solve these in polynomial time. Another thing that could be distracting for people who do play Sudoku is maybe they're in their heads thinking, hey, I can solve Sudoku puzzles completely logically. I have a great little algorithm I run in my head, just follow my procedure, and I never have to guess. And that might be true because you're dealing with the puzzles that are published. And presumably the creators of the puzzles spend some time making sure that they're fun and they're, you know, solvable without being ridiculously difficult. So we're not talking about all the cases of Sudoku. We're talking about the very hardest cases. If someone wanted to give you a puzzle that was virtually impossible, that virtually impossible puzzle, no one has created an efficient algorithm to solve the game. So it does require some guesswork. Now let's go back to this guessing thing. Well, we never left. (laughs) (laughs) Just to be clear. (laughs) If I gave you a puzzle that I filled in with a bunch of guesses and I asked you to check it, how quickly could you check if I had a solution or not? Well, I have to add it up and go row by row, column by column, and then start circling the ones that don't work. And do the sub, you know, three by three squares. So basically, you'd have to do every row, every column, and then every subgroup. So more or less, you could solve this in n squared time, because you'd have to go for every row, for every column, and do a check, right? So it's a polynomial time verification. You can check that a solution is correct efficiently. And you can also say, like, if I just gave you something that wasn't a solution, I just filled it in with random numbers that didn't match. In the worst case, you might have to check every square and only discover the mistake when you check the very last square. But but you could efficiently say, hey, this uh, solution has an error in it. Yeah. Another technical term I'm going to give you is sometimes in literature, we would call that a witness string. And a witness string is basically just the idea of, I give you some encoding of the answer. In the case of Sudoku, it's just, you know, what are the values to fill in? And then you can verify the witness string efficiently. But then the question comes, how did you come up with the witness string? How did you solve the puzzle? If we allow guessing, that's the non-deterministic part of non-deterministic polynomial time, class NP, then you can guess a solution and check it, and we can check it efficiently. So if you had a magic way of guessing really well, then this would work great for you. But in the worst case, you'd have to brute force guess every possible solution and then check it. So I think we've got enough now on the table to do the informal definition of what class NP is. NP is the class of any algorithms which have this property that if someone hands you the solution, or alternatively you just guess the solution, that you can check it or verify it efficiently. Well, let's talk about some other problems that are also in NP. Have you heard of the traveling salesman problem? You mean the traveling saleswoman that you talk about? Okay, yeah. Yes. But uh, I forgot the problem. So this person needs to visit every city in the country, but they don't want to have to repeat going through a city twice because that would be a waste of their time. The solution to the traveling salesperson problem is what's called a tour. It's the list of how they drive and visit all the cities and visit them each only once. So if I gave you such a tour and you you plotted it on a map or whatever, do you think you could verify pretty quickly whether or not it met the criteria? Um, me, if I had to manually, manually plot it? No. Why not? Because I'd have to look at a map. Well, what if I just gave you the map with the route on it? Oh, okay. Well then, yeah, I could just look at it and see. I can zoom in and see, but I don't understand this traveling salesperson problem because just because you didn't visit the same city twice doesn't mean you're efficient. (laughs) Well, so... Okay, data skeptic listeners, I want to tell you about the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. They have a program where you can earn a Master's of Science in Business Analytics degree in just 12 months. You can do this while you're still a working professional. It fits your schedule as long as you can attend classes in downtown Chicago on Fridays and Saturdays. That'd be a real treat. I love the downtown of my hometown. You'll learn from in-person Notre Dame faculty and interact with experienced classmates from a variety of industries and cities across the U.S. While building your network, you'll also have a dedicated career coach to help answer those questions you don't know who exactly to ask about reaching your professional goals. 
Grab a pen or open a new tab for the URL I'm going to give you. It's Mendoza, that's M-E-N-D-O-Z-A, dot N-D dot E-D-U slash Data Skeptics. At their site, you can arrange a Chicago campus visit to learn more about the Master of Science in Business Analytics program. And most importantly, you can get a code to have your application fee waived. Visit Mendoza dot N-D dot E-D-U slash Data Skeptics or email M-S-B-A dot Business at N-D dot E-D-U. Just because you didn't visit the same city twice doesn't mean you're efficient. (laughs) Well, so that's the nature of this problem. The solution we're looking for is the tour that has that property. There are other problems that we could talk about minimizing the distance and stuff. Then what was the point? How is it helpful? I mean, why you want to solve that problem is a separate discussion. But there are useful and interesting problems people would like to solve that fit into this class called NP. What's the use of NP class? Well, in the case of like the traveling salesperson, I could imagine where a company like UPS might be interested in having something like that solved so that they can make their drivers be the most efficient that they can be. But earlier I mentioned that just because you didn't visit the same city twice doesn't mean you're efficient. And now you're associating it with efficiency. So you're right. Maybe the actual problem that a company like UPS has to worry about has some additional constraints that are harder than the traveling salesperson problem. But we know that at least the traveling salesperson problem is a starting point. Their problem is probably harder, but at at a minimum, they need to solve some version of that problem. Or Sudoku is the good example. Why would someone need to solve Sudoku as a business strategy? (laughs) What if, uh, I don't know, you know, somebody said, I'll give you a major contract, but only if you can solve the Sudoku puzzle really fast. (laughs) Or maybe you're a Sudoku puzzle creator. Actually, it's a little bit easier for the creator because they can just write in the numbers that work and then erase a bunch of them. So that's an efficient Mm -hmm. thing to do, Mm -hmm. which actually ties into the NP idea. Again, if you have the solution, verifying it is, is easy. It's efficient. It's coming up with the solution that seems to require a guess to do it. And that's the non-deterministic part. In theory, you know, to solve this, we would need uh, like parallel universes where every universe tries one of the possible solutions and then they all report back if any of them got it right. Well, that should be a movie. <laughs> that would be a good movie. Any, if you want to say that a problem is in NP, you have to show that it has these uh, properties, that you can efficiently verify a, a solution given a witness string, or which is another word for the solution, verify it efficiently. But how you came up with that solution is there's no easy way to do it. And actually, if someone later came along and said, hey, I can come up with the witness string in an efficient way, I have a nice algorithm to do it, then we would say that you've proved that that algorithm is in a less difficult class than NP. But just because, of course, someone more clever could always come up with a better idea. But there are a lot of these problems in NP that as far as we know, they're just hard problems. You have to have a, an unlikely guess to solve them. Well, isn't that life? You have to make a mistake to learn. So we're actually going to go into, we're going to have a whole episode on the question, the open conjecture, one of the most important problems that's open in computer science. Does P equal NP? Does that sound exciting? I'm really excited about that. I thought you were going to say, what's the meaning of life? 42, right? 42, what does that have to do with it? Oh, geez, Linda. Listeners are going to be very disappointed you don't know that reference. What? It's from uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Yeah, I've never seen that nor read the book. But anyway, back to this. So what do you think people do when they have a hard problem that they're interested in solving? It's important to their business, but they have no efficient way of solving it. Goes on the backlog. (laughs) <laughs> well, actually, I was going to say they try and explore approximate solutions, and that's a big topic in NP. You know, maybe we can't find the perfect tour for the traveling salesman problem, but maybe we can find a pretty good one that's like 99% efficient, and we can find that in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, that sounds like a good use of resources. Yeah. So if you have an NP problem, and you're sure that it's in NP, in other words, the lacking constraint here isn't your cleverness. We know that the problem is in NP, so it's unlikely you're going to find an efficient solution. We would call that NP complete for anyone who knows what that means. We're not going to define it here. But in that case, yeah, the best you can hope for is to come up with an approximate solution. So that's what you want to do if you're facing a real world NP problem. Now to wind up, let me hit you with uh, an interesting brain teaser. We've talked about all these problems where they're hard to solve, but efficient to verify a solution. Do you think there are problems that are even harder than that, where you can't even verify the solution efficiently? Yes. How do you know? Because you asked. (laughs) 
<laughs> but that doesn't. Well, mean. I mean, there's one example. Uh -huh. For example, the cost of verification could just take longer than coming up with your guess, right? That's right. So the example I like to go to is a decision problem in chess. So like given a chess board, you can say, is there a one strategy where white can certainly win this game? Yes or no? And the person, there's obviously a yes or no answer. We can, we can say for sure. But if the algorithm that comes up with the yes or no answer, there's no way it can give you a witness string. It can't say like, well, all white has to do is follow these bunch of steps and then for sure they're going to win. There's no way black can come back from it. Because whatever strategy it is also is adversarial. It includes what black is going to do. Then it's like a mini max game. There's some back and forth to it. So you can't give them just one string that describes the winning strategy for all games, at least. Maybe if, you know, you're down to the last three or four moves, you can say all white has to do is these couple of things and whatever black does doesn't matter. But in the general case, sure, you can answer this question. There is an answer, right? Does white have a winning strategy? That must be true or false. But there's actually, the problem is worse than NP because you can't even provide a solution which is verifiable efficiently. So have I succeeded in teaching you the properties of uh, problems that are in NP? I learned a little bit about how guessing works. You use it as a technique. Uh-huh. In what way? To test if you're correct or wrong. And if you're wrong, what do you do? Well, the question is, is it 100% wrong or some other... In Sudoku, are there certain areas that are right? Keep the ones that are right and try again on the ones that are wrong. Oh, actually, so now you're getting off into an interesting tangent. If we just guess and then uh, we, verif we try and do the verification and we say, nope, this is not a solution. Can you learn anything from the guess? Like in your case, you're saying, well, keep the parts of the Sudoku puzzle that seem to work well. Well, it might be that your Sudoku solution is a house of cards and that there's nothing you can learn that sort of transfers to other examples. And that is actually the crux of NP. If you could make a guess and learn enough from a, a bad guess that you could eliminate some of the other guesses you might have to make, then actually that would be a way of solving something efficiently, uh, potentially, which would mean you have cracked the problem and taken it out of NP and put it in P. Anytime a problem is firmly in NP, like we've proven it's in NP, uh, or at least we prove that it's NP complete, meaning uh, we think that it's unlikely someone is going to come up with a better solution later, unless, of course, P equals NP, then you're not going to really learn enough from each guess to carry over into the next attempt. So you really kind of have to brute force every guess almost. Hmm. NP problems are extremely difficult as far as anyone knows. And uh, in an upcoming interview, we're going to delve deeper into this topic of this very open problem, which, by the way, you can win a million dollars if you solve. Resolve does P equal NP or does P not, uh, as I believe, P not equal NP. I believe this sort of not based on logic because no proof exists. I just believe it because it seems to be correct. And the opposite seems ludicrous to me. Um, there are many strange things that would also be true if P equal then P. So if I'm right, as most computer scientists believe that P does not equal NP, then that also means I believe that there are intrinsically hard problems. Well, then stay tuned to learn more. And until next time, keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 